Hello everyone! In this video, our topic is Fiam or in other words the mummy portraits. These extremely realistic portraits made on a wooden plate and placed on the face of the mummified person, and they are called the Fiam portraits. We know that these portraits were rarely used, just around 400 years, from the 1st century of BC to the 3rd century of AD. Around 1,000 mummy portraits have been found so far, which shows that it is not a very common practice. These portraits are called Fiam portraits because most were found in the Fiam region of Egypt. Fiam is an area 100 kilometers away to the south of Cairo. It does not cover a very large area. Its width from east to west is around 60 kilometers. The ancient Egyptians called this area Merar, the Great Lake. When Fiam was ruled by the Egyptians, the lack of clean water between 300 BC and 300 BC prevented the population from increasing. However, despite the low population and limited irrigation, the earliest food production experiments in Egypt, namely agriculture experiments, were made in Fayyam. Fayyam's unfortunate history changed when the rule of Egypt falls into the hands of Alexander the Great. After the conquest of Egypt in 332 BC and transferred the capital to the new megacity, Alexandria. A new era begins in Fayyam as in all of Egypt with Alexander the Great. After this, Egypt had become more intertwined with Hellenic culture than ever, and control of the country was left to one of Alexander's generals, General Ptolemy, with the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC. After this time, Egypt was ruled by the Ptolemaic dynasty or in its Arabic name the Batlamius dynasty until 30 BC. We all know a very famous member of this dynasty, Queen Cleopatra. Queen Cleopatra was a member of the Ptolemaic dynasty and she was the last Ptolemy ruler. Her great-grandfathers were Macedonians but they were kings of Egypt. So Egypt was ruled by a Macedonian dynasty for centuries. The Ptolemaic dynasty started a new settlement policy when they took control of the country. They had started to give great support to the merchant families he brought from Macedonia and Greece and settled them in Alexandria. And with this move, they caused the city trade of Alexandria to be controlled by the Hellenic merchant families. Likewise, they settled retired Greek soldiers and young farmers with their families on the banks of the Nile, especially in the Fayyam region. The purpose of this move was that the Ptolemies were a foreign dynasty and Egyptian people had no loyalty to them. By creating their own people, they tried to take control of Egypt, and they were successful in such as places like Fayyam and Alexandria. The Ptolemies did not forget these people they settled in Fayyam. They opened water channels from the Nile River to Fayyam and brought water to the region. After this development, Fayyam became one of the richest agricultural basins in Egypt and became richer day by day. If we look at the people who lived in Fayyam, some of these people continued to live like Greeks after they settled in, even their names were Greek. The families who settled in Fayyam were generally married with local Egyptian people. Because when the faces in the mummy portraits and the teeth and bone analyzes of the mummies were examined, it was seen that the generation born and raised in Fayyam was more like Egyptians than Europeans compared to the first settlers. Although their names were Greek and they tried not to lose their origins, their culture and beliefs were influenced by Egyptian religions. For example in this period, new gods appeared, who took something from both Greek and Egyptian pantheons, and these gods became very popular. The most famous gods of this period was Serapis. This god, Serapis, who emerged in the 3rd century BC when Alexander the Great and later the Ptolemies dominated the region, began to be worshipped in the entire Mediterranean basin when Rome dominated the region. Although Serapis looks like the Greek gods in appearance, he takes his features such as rebirth from the Egyptian gods. It would not be wrong to say that Serapis, which has features from the Greek gods Hades, Demeter, and Asclepius, as well as the features he took from the Egyptian gods, Isis, Osiris, and Apis, is one of the most important symbols of the Hellenic and Egyptian culture formed in Alexandria and Fayyam. Hermanubis, who is an extremely interesting god, like Serapis, is another god created by these two intertwined cultures. As the name suggests, the task of this god, who is a mixture of Hermes and Anubis, is to accompany the souls of the dead in the afterlife. Although Hermes is known as the messenger of Zeus, one of his duties is to accompany the spirits to the land of Hades, the door of the underworld. Likewise Anubis. 
Anubis accompanies souls from the time of corpse put in the tomb to the judgment of the soul by Osiris. In fact, the priest who reads the Book of the Dead during the mummification process was worn an Anubis mask to represent Anubis. Anubis accompanies the dead bodies, even during the mummification process and every stage of the preparation after death. Hermanubis is also a god related to death in the aftermath. He has the head of a jackal, just like Anubis, but he dresses as a Greek just like Hermes and he carries Caduceus, the scepter of Hermes. At the beginning of the 2nd century BC, the Greeks who lived in Egypt, where the gods were so intertwined, began to mummify their dead, influenced by Egyptian traditions. When the Romans took over the region in 30 BC, the Greeks living in the region managed to preserve their status and a much more cultured structure emerged thanks to the Roman aristocrats. These mummy portraits are actually a product of that hybrid culture, because, with Roman domination in the region, 2D mummy portraits began to be placed on the faces of some mummies, these portraits were not like the Egyptians' masks. After the classical wrapping process in Fiam mummies, the portrait of the deceased is placed on his face, and after that, one more layer of wrapping is applied to fix the portrait exactly on the face of the deceased. After the name and profession of the dead were written in Greek, protective texts and prayers were written with hieroglyphs, they were placed in the mummy's coffin, and then these mummies were left in the burial chambers, facing the door as if standing upright. According to these inscriptions, the people in the portraits were mostly wealthy, upper-class soldiers, upper-class clergy, government officials, and their families. As I said before the mummified people belonged to a hybrid culture. That's why the people whose portraits were painted don't look like the Greeks, and if you've noticed, most of them are young. According to anthropologists, the average life of the Egyptian people at the time the portraits were made was 35 years. Although it is known that life was short in Egypt at that time, it is not yet known why only portraits of young people and children were made. However, despite all this, there are a few mummy portraits belonging to older people, but these portraits really rare. It is thought that these portraits were either made in people's homes before they died and kept ready in a corner, or they were made during the mummification process after the person died. But my personal opinion is that these portraits were made after people died, because there are portraits of people who died and were mummified at a young age, and it is illogical to have a portrait made for a child in case he or she dies. Because, that child will grow up and his face will change along with his physique. So it's a very unnecessary procedure. As I said before there are around 1,000 mummy portraits have been found so far, which shows us that it's a very rare practice. Because there are also mummies without portraits in Fiam that were embalmed and wrapped with the same technique. The boards of portraits were made were brought from abroad. Most of them were made from imported hardwoods such as oak, lemon, sycamore, cypress, cedar, fig, and citrus. The trees were cut into thin panels about 1.5 centimeters thick, sanded, smoothed, and used. In addition, the price of portraits was probably extremely high, because substances such as wax, root paint, various oils, and gold dust were used in the making of the portraits, and extremely talented painters were hired for this work. Not everyone could afford the mummification price, this process required very serious financial strength. And Fiam portrait shows us that even a very small group of people who could afford the mummification could be ordered these portraits made. Only 2% of the mummies found in Fayum have these portraits. Now, I think we've come to the most enjoyable part of Fiam portraits. If you have a good eye and knowledge of Roman sculpture art, you can tell when the portraits were made as soon as you look at them. Because the hair and beard types of the portraits followed the emperor and his family. When an emperor ascends to the throne, his busts and statues were sent all over the empire so that the public can recognize him. Likewise, on the coins minted in his name, the public could see the emperor and sometimes the empress. Just like today, people imitated leaders or popular figures and imitated their dressing style, hair, and beard style, trying to emulate them. This similarity can be seen not only in hair and beard types but also in their clothes. In general, men and women are depicted wearing a cloak over a thin tunic, just like the Romans. Women and children are mostly depicted with jewels. The jewels are also smaller and simpler jewels made in the Greco-Roman style, not the large and ostentatious jewels used by the Egyptians. 
To give an example of this topic, the most easily recognized types are the mummy portraits of Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius was an emperor who ruled Roman Empire from 161 to 180 AD. He is known as the philosopher emperor and he is considered the last of the five good emperors. He was a brilliant emperor and he always praised in history books. When we look at the sculptures and portraits of Marcus Aurelius, we can easily recognize him by his curly hair, beard, and swollen eyes. When we look at the Fiam portraits, we can easily see that the hair and beard type of the emperor Marcus Aurelius was followed by the people of the period. Likewise, when we look at Marcus Aurelius' wife, Faustina the Younger, we can see that her hairstyle, which is parted in the middle and joined at the back, is imitated by the women who lived in Fayyum. Now let's go back a little further and go back to the reign of Trajan, who was the Roman emperor between 98 and 117 AD. Trajan is a soldier-based emperor, when we look at his busts and statues, his military habits can be seen. Bust of Trajan on the left. We see a neat, shaved face and a simple cut short hair. A true Roman general. Today's soldiers are more or less the same. On the right is a portrait of Fiam dating to his period. People have always imitated leaders and popular figures. Finally, Fiam portraits are works of art that look extremely alive. The people whose portraits are made look as they are saying goodbye to their loved ones. The pain of death is perhaps one of the rare things that hasn't changed since 2000 years. Whenever I look at Fayum's portraits, I see people who breathe the air of this world, laugh, cry, fall in love, grieve, love, and be loved, just like us. They had families, mothers, fathers, siblings, wives, and children's too. Maybe these portraits eased the pain of those left behind, maybe these portraits wanted the people they loved not to be forgotten for generations, and they really did. You can see these people, most of whom were related to each other, in museums almost all over the world today. They still continue to welcome their visitors with sadness. I have studied hundreds of Fiam portraits so far, but one of them made my heart ache every time. Looking at the other portraits, we see goodbye and despair, but this child looks very unhappy and scared. I think he says I couldn't get enough of the world, he looked like he wants his mummy. As I said before, this is the portrait that saddens and affects me the most. That's how Fiam Portraits is the subject, as I have so much pleasure to talk about and examine. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos and recommend it to your friends. See you in the next video.